Uh, look, this is the thing about Henry Armstrong. Everyone talks about the three world titles and three separate weight classes. It was four. He beat Seferino Garcia in 10 rounds for, middle, for the middleweight title. The fix was in, and Armstrong was given the draw. In any objective analysis of ring history, Armstrong is a four division world titleist. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a Boxing Universe presentation. Keep coming, never stop punching. Customato, when he was starting to talk about how Mike Tyson, a young Mike Tyson, was going to fight, you know who he picked? Henry Armstrong. Henry Armstrong was an intelligent man in a world that refused to allow him to use it. He was born into the wrong side of a system of racial segregation. His father was black, his mother a full-blooded Iroquois. In Mississippi, the most he could hope to be was a second-class citizen. His parents moved to St. Louis when he was a kid. This gave Henry the opportunity to attend high school. Every day he'd walk home from school past a boxing gym. Boxing became a hobby for Henry until he graduated high school with honors. There was no place for himself in higher education, so he took a job driving railroad spikes for 10 hours a day. That was almost a full day's pay for a St. Louis teenager doing track maintenance work for the railroad. He didn't know it then, but this was weight training for his next career. Developing a broad One morning, he read an article about the Cuban great Kid Chocolate making $70,000 for a single night's work in Madison Square Garden. Henry was smart enough to do some simple math. It would take him decades to make that working on a railroad. He quit his job and committed to boxing. The early days of his career were during the depths of the Great Depression. He fought just to eat. After his second fight, Henry decided to resettle in Los Angeles. It didn't go much better there. His early career was a mixed bag as he learned the sport on the fly. He turned pro in 1932. By the end of 1935, he'd fought over 58 times. But something clicked in 1936. Henry Armstrong perfected pressure fighting. That year was the last time Henry Armstrong took a step back, and that decision led to one of the most terrifying runs in boxing history. He was a suffocating mix of intense pressure and constant movement. Now at 23, with his grown man muscle and refined front foot fury, Henry Armstrong looked unstoppable. Developing a broad chest, thick shoulders, and big arms, Henry Armstrong would become one of the most dominant forces in boxing history. On a technical level, he fought from an exaggerated crouch that made his 5 foot 5 inch frame an even smaller target. He would either jab high and duck in low to get inside, crash with a right hand, or simply tuck in his high guard and force his way in behind either of his shoulders or the top of his head. This would force his opponents upright and gave Henry easy access to all the routes to the body. When opponents tried to counter, he'd drop his level and come up firing. And there really wasn't much a featherweight in the world could do about it. It wasn't until December of 37 that Henry Armstrong got his first title shot. He took on Petey Sarin for his 126 pound championship and steamrolled the shell-shocked former champion in six rounds. Upon winning the championship, Henry left the featherweight division He'd been fighting at 126 since he was a teenager and had naturally outgrown it. So Henry started fighting lightweights. Barney Ross was a highly respected longtime lightweight champion who'd recently gone up to 147 and defeated Serafina Garcia on points to become the new welterweight champion. The new lightweight champion was Lou Ambers, who'd taken up Ross's title when Ross vacated. Barney knew Armstrong wanted the title at multiple weights and offered Henry a shot. Henry was not a man to let an opportunity pass, so he completely stepped over the lightweight division to take on the welterweight champ. Barney Ross was a beloved champion, a fine scientific boxer willing and able to go to war. He was also the last of a dying breed. Along with Benny Leonard and Slapsy Maxie Rosenblum, Ross made the late 20s and early 30s the age of the Jewish champion. Barney Ross was the last survivor. He was 72, 3 and 3 and was never stopped. The boxing world respected Ross and so did Henry. Ross also knew Armstrong was nowhere near a natural welterweight. 
Henry came in at 133 pounds for a fight at 147. On the canvas, Henry Armstrong put on a god-tier performance of elusive infighting. Barney was a smart fighter, knew how to keep Henry turning, knew how to dig with the uppercut to dig him out of his natural crouch. He knew to retake ring center and to make Armstrong pay for every inch of space he took. But nothing he did could convince Henry to take a step back. Barney Ross was stuck in a Henry Armstrong fight. They called him Hurricane Henry for a reason. He was a force of nature. While Barney would make the final bell, Henry Armstrong would make history. The winner and new world well away champion, Armstrong. The champion Henry passed over to get to the welterweight belt was waiting. Lou Ambers was a fish in a shark tank. It went down in the reference books as a close fight, but only because the referee decided to make himself a nuisance. It was a violent slugging war with Ambers in a desperate bid to hold his ground. Henry was penalized four rounds for low blows. The fight was still called a split decision in his favor. It was also called the fight of the year for 1938. Henry Armstrong was the first three-weight world champion in boxing history. This was in a time when boxing only had seven weight classes total and one belt per weight. Three full titles. These guys nowadays, if they fight four times in a year, we're like, wow, wow. It's fought about 35 times in a year. Henry moved back up to welterweight to defend his title against his first full-sized opponent, Serafino Garcia. The size discrepancy was obvious. It didn't matter much to Henry, who worked smarter instead of harder. He used leverage to push back the bigger man and keep him off balance, unable to throw his power punches. Because Garcia was so tall, it made it all the easier to get underneath his shots. Henry was coming up firing. He raced forward the instant the distance opened. He ran a full-blown welterweight down like a cheetah pulling down a gazelle. Henry proved again that pace and pressure can make up for a massive amount of weight. Armstrong proved his ability as a three-weight champion defending his welterweight title against larger fighters. But it wasn't long before Lou Ambers reared his ugly head again to challenge Henry for the lightweight championship. The second fight was a virtual rerun of the first, which is to say it was another contender for fight of the year. It was also sprinkled throughout with both men straying below the belt, but Henry was the one getting penalized for it. Again, the referee had an oversized impact on the fight. This time Henry couldn't overcome the zealous ref, and lost a split decision on two of the three cards. The winner, and a game the world lightweight champion, Lou Amber. Now merely the welterweight champion, Henry kept to a diligent schedule of title defenses. But even being the first three-weight champion in boxing wasn't enough for the oversized ambition of the tank of a featherweight that took over boxing. Serafino Garcia went up to middleweight and knocked out champion Fred Apostoli to add the 160-pound title. Henry had already bullied Garcia once at welterweight, and now the biggest little man in boxing saw an opportunity to make history once more. There are two confounding circumstances that kept Henry from being a four-weight champion. The first was the length of the match. Despite the fight being for the championship, it was inexplicably only set for a 10-round distance Henry Armstrong wasn't the type to tire over the distance. The other bad sign was the fight was to be decided solely by the referee instead of the traditional three ringside judges. Despite a dominant effort, that referee called the fight a draw, then never refereed another fight. It cost Henry another chance at history. The truth was though, Henry was getting old, not by the calendar, but his kamikaze pressure fighting had seen Henry rack up the mileage and wear and tear on his body. In reality, Henry was never really a welterweight, with his weight rarely reaching the 147 pound limit. Henry finally met his match in another brilliant infighter by the name of Fritzi Zivik. It took 130 fights, but the time had finally come for Henry Armstrong. 
He fought ferociously as always, but boxing has always been a young man's sport. Henry's focus started to stray. He appeared in the film The Pittsburgh Kid in 1941, along with Billy Kahn. Henry was often seen in the glamorous company of Hollywood starlets. He fought for the last time in 1945. His final record was a staggering 149 to 21 to 10 with 99 knockouts. A first ballot Hall of Famer and the blueprint for every pressure fighter that came after. In his retirement, Henry turned to God and became a preacher, living a quiet, unassuming life back in St. Louis. But never begrudging a student of the sweet science a lesson in his savage craft. Lee Armstrong held full title. No in between featherweight, lightweight, welterweight. Fought that fight with um, Garcia, as you said, didn't get the win. Most people thought that he won the fight. Sex for a guy who won titles in three different classes and almost won a fourth. Now this is pound for pound month here on the deuce. So we look back at one of the classics, one of the greatest of all times, Henry Armstrong. Armstrong's spiritual awakening represented just one of the many sides of his personality. This furious fighting machine was also a painter, a poet, and a composer. A composer good enough to have two of his ballads performed by Nat King Cole. I mean, there's a lot of great ones, a lot of great ones, but um, that's one of them. Do you want to join our community of Boxing Universe enthusiasts? Hit the subscribe button, write your comments and thoughts for this video, and don't miss out on the next one.